grace truly is amazing, right? You know, I've sat at the bedside of many people while they lay dying. It's one of those solemn occasions. It's a sad one. But it's different when it's one of your loved ones. At the bedside of my grandparents when they passed away, my parents when they passed away. I watched them as they lay there dying and watched them die. It was a powerless feeling. You know what's coming. And you know there isn't anything you can do about it. You wish it wasn't happening and yet you want it to be as painless and easy as it could be. You want Jesus to come and take them home at the same time you want just to get all better so you can take them to your home. Mm -hmm. They're still alive but not really. Life is ebbing away moment by moment. You're not sure if you're breathing sometimes and tears are are built up inside waiting to splash out. Oh. Doctors and nurses are doing all they can, but really it's no more than keeping them comfortable and out of pain. As you sit in the hospital hearing the sounds around you between prayers, your mind slips, and you think about the outside world, you think about our nation, the way <coughs> People say, can't seem to get along and politicians don't get their jobs done. And you think about many things. Problems, economic, cultural, ideological, educational. It seems you can't find a single place for your mind to rest. And then looking back at your loved one, watching them breathe, counting how many breaths a minute they and you realize it's less than it was. And one word comes to mind. Powerless. You're not sure how long it's going to be, but you decide to try to get a quick nap. But it's only a fitful bit of sleep, and if it's any sleep at all. You think about your job and how it feels like you're just a cog in the wheel, and you think about making a change, but how can you? And again, you feel powerless. Not all of us will find ourselves in these situations, these circumstances, but we can understand the feeling of that powerlessness. It's a feeling we don't like. Maybe it's our health. Maybe our health feels like everything is crashing and falling apart. And, you know, you're in pretty good health most of your life, and now everything is up in the air. Doctors keep finding something else wrong with you. You feel like everything is spinning out of control. And you feel, what? Powerless. We like to be in control. I mean, that's just a fact. We just like to be in control. And we, 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 we at least want to feel like we have a choice, right? We prefer power to powerlessness. We take out insurance. We build up our savings for emergencies. We set up home security systems. And we do everything we can do in the name of planning and responsibility and common sense to ward off that feeling of powerlessness. But still, we feel powerless. Even Christians have to fight off the temptation given to fear in the face of obstacles and challenges and and we pray and trust God as our ultimate source of power and security. And the temptation to fear and worry is always lurking in the shadows. And we know that Christians are not immune to fear because Paul said in 2 Timothy 1 7, God has not given us, God has, God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and self control. Right here in this one verse, notice it has both keywords fear and power. 
We have not been given a spirit of fear, but he gives us that spirit of power. Our message today is, are you powerless? And we're still in the series Hoodwinked. By the way, next week we're going to wrap up this series with a message called, Does God Still Heal? This is our fourth in this series. Before we continue on, though, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you for our, our time in your word, and we thank you that we can open up this word and study it, and Father, get closer to you. May we have that hunger to study your word. May we have the thirst for prayer we need to have. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love, for your son Jesus, who died for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, regardless of how we feel in any given situation, we have to remember that we've been given power, not fear. We are not powerless no matter how weak we may feel. But guess who's just lurking in the shadows when we find ourselves in a trying situation? Yeah, it's old Satan himself. Remember, he walks around like a roaring lion just looking for somebody to devour. We know this because 1 Peter 5, 8, B says, Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He's just looking for somebody out there by themselves. That's why church is important. If he sees us descending into fear and the feeling of powerlessness, it's his opening to pounce on us. Ephesians 4.20 says, says, Don't give the slanderous accuser, the devil, an opportunity to manipulate you. Who is he? He is the slanderous accuser. Yeah, the devil. You see, Satan wants to destroy the confidence you have in the power of God. If Satan senses an opening based on your fear and your feeling of being without any power at all, he's going to try to convince you that God doesn't care. He's going to try to convince you that God doesn't have a plan or the power to control the world's affairs and that God is not concerned about you and the happiness of your family and, and the, your provision, and, and he's going to pounce upon you like a spiritual bully. You ever had to deal with a bully? You know, my family moved a lot. My wife went to one school her whole life. It was arranged, so you went to kindergarten down here, went through grade school, junior high, and high school, went out the other end. I, on the other hand, went to, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight schools in 12 years. I was always a new kid in school. There was always somebody who wanted to know what I was made of. Schoolyard bullies, just that, you're a bully. Bully always wants to pick on the one that he thinks is the most vulnerable, and then he's going to start in on them. They use words, like a little chihuahua, always barking. <laughs> See, that's what they do best, is they, they run their mouth. They pick on the small kid, but they don't fight back. Then it all starts. What are you going to do? Run home to mommy? What are you going to do? Call your daddy? He's not here. He's not going to help you. So their main goal is to make this kid feel like he has no power. I've always said the best way to handle a bully is head on. Why? Bullies don't want to get hurt. They're allergic to pain. They don't want to get hurt. They're afraid of it. That's the way Satan is. He likes to run his mouth. But he's afraid of our daddy. He's afraid of Father God. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's our 
already been whipped by Jesus himself. And when we meet him head on in Jesus' name, we win. Don't get fooled. Don't get hoodwinked. Don't listen to those people that tell you, well, Satan really has more power. No, he don't. He only has a power you allow him to have. Preach. He's already a defeating foe. When the prophet priest Zerubbabel returned to Judah from being in captivity at, Bab at, Bab at Babylon, he faced a daunting task of rebuilding the temple. And the Lord spoke to him, and in Zechariah 4, 6, he said this, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That's the way that we face that bully Satan. Not by our might, not by our power, but by the power of the Spirit of the living God. That's the way we face Him. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit that we are called to face challenges and overcome obstacles. Acts 1 8 says, But you receive power. When? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is power. That's the spirit of the Almighty God. But let me tell you something. Satan wants to make you forget that. He wants to make you forget it. Why? Because he's a bully. He's a bully. He doesn't want you to rely on the power of God's Holy Spirit. He wants you to try and do it on your own might and your own Power, but not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. When you do it on your own, then you will fall into a deeper feeling of powerlessness. In 2010, I went to Africa, Namibia, on a mission trip, and uh, it was a great time. Saw people saved, and I've been the and, you know, we had our plan, we're going to start this church in this town in Namibia. But the people who were getting saved started the church before we could. Which was awesome because it made it totally their church, right? But I was the first white man to get to preach in that church. You think that wasn't fun? That was great. But on our way back to the airport in Ben, ben took we we stayed at night in the Otashi National Park. Now this is a place that's over 1,800 square miles that has wild animals, natural habitat. They've got this huge fence that can't get out, so when you go through, you're on their territory. And you can drive around and look, but you gotta remember, there's lions you don't see. Sometimes there's a pride of lions laying there, it's like a bunch of rocks, until the rocks move. Right? We saw zebras. Way too many zebras. <laughs> we saw elephants and the cows and calves look like we see in the zoos about that size. And then we saw this big bull elephant that looked like a mastodon. This thing was huge. And we weren't even close to it. Right? We saw giraffes. I learned to love watching giraffes. They're so graceful. But where we stayed, we stayed a night there. It's in the middle of this park, and they closed the gates at night so a lot of animals don't come in where you're staying. And the day before we got there, they couldn't open the gates because there's a pride of lions laying in front of the gate. So you gotta wait for the lions to leave. You don't say, she can. It didn't work. You know, be a nice lunch for them. So we ate supper and there was an area there at a water hole. It's, it's, a, it's a dry area, so water is a valuable thing. You can watch the animals come up and drink. And at night time, there's a big light shines down this water hole. You can sit there and watch down. They, think they can't get to you. It's far enough down. And you watch animals come up 
the tree. Well, we're sitting there watching and these giraffes come up. And they're like I said, I love to watch giraffes because they're so graceful. And they come to drink, but to drink, the giraffes gotta put their front legs way out like this because their necks are so long. And then they bend over to drink. Well, they're easy prey. At that watering hole was a pride of lions. We couldn't see the lion, we could see his silhouette over here. We could see the females, and we could hear the male talking to them. We <coughs> start moving. Well, this group of giraffes, there was one in about, I, I, I described it as a teenager, it wasn't grown all the way, it wasn't a calf either. They all drank except for him, he was, he was watching out. He was too scared to drink. Well, they all moved back away and waited for this giraffe to drink. And after an hour or so, they got tired of it, they left. Oh, now, supper time. <laughs> These lionesses start moving. And it's just, you can't run, you can't run. What do you do, right? You don't get a drink because then you're really easy prey. Well, this giraffe is scared to death. And we're just, we're just waiting to see nature. But what happens next? These rhinos come in and they are huge. You know what this male rhino did? He chased away the lions. They didn't want to get stuck. He chased them away. They drank, the giraffe drank, they left, he left with them. I got protectors, right? Remember 1 Peter 5 8? I used it just a minute ago and share what I can do with you again because there's, there's more to it. It says, be sober minded. Be watchful. Why? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Those lions were seeking that giraffe to devour. That giraffe was being watchful and scared to death. We must be sober-minded. We must be watchful. We must be aware that Satan is like a roaring lion, looking for somebody to take down and eat or devour. Looking for easy prey. As a spiritual bully, Satan is looking for any weaknesses we show so he can exploit them, those weaknesses. Remember, lions will look for the weakest in the herd and that's their next meal. Satan will attack the church to look for the weakest he can find and he will attack and try to pull down whoever he can and if he can pull me down, he thinks that leaves you open. Remember, he is a spiritual bully. Why is it important to be in church? Because we are with a group. We pull each other up and we help protect each other. That's our job. If we're not doing that, we're failing. It's our job to be with each other in fellowship and be praying for each other. Be with each other in Bible study. That's why... I, our men's class is so important up here, guys. If you're not busy on Sunday morning at 9 a.m., be here. We have a great time discussing the Bible. Your wife can go with the ladies. My wife teaches the ladies. She teaches really good. Just in case you didn't know that, she teaches really good. But guys, we have a wonderful time talking about God's Word and learning from it, learning from each other. That's what men do. Iron sharpens iron. Right? As one man sharpens another. <coughs> Guys, I challenge you to be here. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. You know, Satan, he likes to use <coughs> our emotions. He likes to use anger and other negative emotions. You don't deserve that. You should get even. Well, that preacher didn't even talk to me this morning. He don't deserve me at that church. He didn't even shake my hand. I'm sorry. Right? He uses guilt and shame. God's not going to forgive you. He's not going to forgive you. You committed that sin too many times and you know better. 
He likes to attack your financial security or insecurity. How are you going to pay that stack of bills on the kind of money you make? God has left you high and dry again. Why would you even think about paying tithes? He likes to use guidance. You've got a decision to make. Face it, God doesn't care about your future. He's got more important things to deal with than you. He likes to use your relationships. So what if that person you're interested in doesn't know the Lord? Go ahead with your feelings. After all, God wants you to be happy, right? He likes to use unforgiveness. If he can get you where you will not forgive, he has you right where he wants you. He doesn't deserve your forgiveness. He doesn't deserve it. You have the right to feel the way you do. By the way, not forgiving somebody is you drinking the poison, hoping it's going to hurt them. It doesn't work. Right? Don't get hoodwinked. Satan, that bully, is out to deceive you. He's out to trick you. He lies to you. He wants you to be so mixed up, you don't know which way is up. And when he gets you there, you're easy prey. He wants you listening to that person that will lead you astray. Don't get fooled. Don't get hoodwinked. You see, these are the voices that we need to be on the alert of. Every one of those situations can lead us to the power of, or the feeling of powerlessness. 